Hey everyone, Ray here, with another book recommendation. With his fact-based novels, Churchill's Secret Messenger and The Long Flight Home, USA Today best-selling author Alan Ladd has made a name for himself as a go-to writer for thrilling, well-researched World War II historical fiction inspired by true events. But in his newest book, A Light Beyond the Trenches, he transports readers to an earlier time and fight the battle-blinded veterans of World War I, and the guide dogs that brought them new hope and independence. Inspired by true events and incorporating real historical figures, Alan Ladd's third novel tells of the first training school for seeing eye dogs, founded by Dr. Gerhard Stalling in 1916 Germany, as thousands of soldiers were being blinded by the use of poison gas in World War I. Pick up your copy of Alan Ladd's A Light Beyond the Trenches everywhere books are sold. And for more information, visit alanladd.com. That's alan, H-L-A-D, dot com. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast. Episode 357, Operation Halbert. As the summer of 1941 settled in, the various military branches on Malta were diverting in importance. With the German Luftwaffe having left the area to help destroy Soviet Russia, the RAF pilots had to mostly contend with the Italians, when and if they showed up, which was about once a day which meant the various fighter squadrons could participate in harassing Axis convoys heading to North Africa. On the other hand, the Malta-based subs were at their height in terms of kills and recognition of those kills. Indeed, on September 1st, the subs were officially given flotilla status, specifically the 10th Submarine Flotilla, and with that designation, awards were handed out. Shrimp Simpson became a captain, and 11 men of the upholder, including their captain, Wanklin, or Wanks as he was called, were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, or DSC. And beyond that, their accommodations while in port were improving with each passing day. More underground rooms were being made ready for them, and a cinema was dug out as well, so the Allied troops could enjoy the latest movie from Walt Disney Studios that being Dumbo. And we've already seen that the subcrews were expected to keep pigs when off duty to help keep the men engaged, as a warrior who gets bored is hardly ever a good thing. Now, rabbits and a small garden were added to that list. Yes, these men could die at any moment when out on the seas, but while on land, they were expected, however much was possible, to get on with living. Always a wise course. Not that the pilots were too far behind. RAF pilot Tom Neal, who would go on to shoot down 14 enemy aircraft, specifically six Messerschmitt 109s, two Heinkel 111s, a Messerschmitt 110, a Junkers 87, a Junkers 88, and a Dornier 17, and was currently a flight commander, was getting a little annoyed with how badly their planes were serviced. This was mostly due to the constant dust and a lack of supplies. Now, it's important to keep in mind that one Britain's annoyance is the equivalent of an American being apoplectic. With that, each day Tom Neal saw his machines getting older and not being replaced fast enough. Tom had already spoken to Air Commodore Hugh Pugh Lloyd a few times, but had gotten nowhere. Tom chalked this up to Pew being from Bomber Command and not really understanding the details of fighter combat. Instead, Lloyd would reply with, Forget about the planes. What you need, you need to be more offensively minded. You know, take the fight to the enemy. As if this macho BS would somehow make the planes work better or the dust disappear. Tom already had five engines quit on him recently and one locked up on his friend just after Tom had flown that plane. As he had explained to Hugh Pugh, who wasn't fully listening, the Mark Ones, yes, there were still a few around, were more dangerous to fly than taking on the Germans. The Mark Twos weren't all that much better, but 
could keep up with some of the Italian aircraft, but not their latest machines. And heaven help all of us if the Germans reappear with their 109s. It would be safer to just go underground. As luck would have it, one day in the near future, an RAF plane landed, and a man got out and started looking around. Tom spotted his gaze and the way he walked. Clearly, he was a VIP. So, not letting a chance like this go to waste, soon Tom was talking to this tall, lean man about all their problems, saying, we need Spitfires, or maybe American Tomahawks. At least they would be better than what we currently have. The man listened, nodded, and soon flew away. Only afterward did Tom discover that he had been talking and bitching unreservedly to Air Officer Commanding the Middle East Air Marshal Arthur Tedder, who at the time was not wearing his Air Marshal stripes. After getting over his shock, Tom told his friends, well, if I don't get sacked, maybe something good will come of it. But getting back to the subs, we saw last time as the upholder, along with the upright, Ursula, and unbeaten, dashed to the Tripoli coast as an Italian convoy had been spotted, leaving Sicily. When it was all over, the ocean liners Neptunia and Oceana had been sunk. On board had been 19,500 German soldiers on each ship. As the subs were on their way back to Malta and the cheering stopped, the men could not but think about all those lost souls. Then they pushed all their negative feelings aside, as this was a war, and they had a job to do. As Tubby, the second in command, was heard to say, war is awful. Instead, they focused on all the Allied lives saved in North Africa, as these German soldiers would never reach land again. Overall, Admiral Cunningham, the commander of the Mediterranean Theater, knew that his operation might have been on a shoestring, but it was a shoestring that kept tripping up the enemy. Case in point, according to the French Review of National Defense of 1954, the Axis had, in June of 1941, 118,000 tons of shipping available to reinforce Rommel. By the end of that month, June, they had lost 7% of those ships to Allied attacks. In July, that loss rate went up to 17%. In August, 25% of the shipping was lost to Malta's planes and subs. But it was September that saw a worrying loss of 40% of Axis shipping. And if we can, for a moment, go past the current storyline, October saw a loss of 63%, and November racked up a whopping 77% loss. Clearly, Malta was living up to its potential. And staying just for a moment past the main timeline, in mid-November, Italy's foreign minister, Count Ciano, Mussolini's son-in-law, wrote in his diary, Since 15 September, we have given up trying to get convoys through to Libya. Every attempt had been very costly, and the losses suffered by our merchant marine have reached such proportions as to discourage any further experiments. Tonight, we tried it again. Libya needs materials, arms, fuel, more and more every day. And of one particular night in mid-November, he would write, All, I mean all our ships were sunk, and maybe one or maybe two or three destroyers. Under the circumstances, we have no right to complain if Hitler sends us Kesselring as commander in the South. Hitler would send Kesselring and Malta would suffer because of it. So, overall, though stressed, Admiral Cunningham and First Sea Lord Dudley Pound were happy with the Mediterranean. Yes, more ships would be nice, and they were being repaired and constructed, but for the moment, the planes and subs were doing ABC proud, so he kept them at it, which was bad news for the Italians and the Germans, but also bad for Malta, because soon... With the increase in operations, fuel once again became an issue. This frustrated ABC and Churchill as they were enjoying being on the offensive after so many defensive setbacks since 1940. Thus, another convoy would be assembled, but this one was to be the largest so far. 
This convoy, labeled GM2, as in from Gibraltar to Malta, would have nine merchantmen with at least 85,000 tons of supplies and 2,600 soldiers. All this would be protected by Force H of three battleships, Prince of Wales, Nelson, and of course, Admiral James Somerville's flagship, HMS Rodney, a Nelson-class battleship. Along with the dreadnoughts would be the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, with five cruisers and eight destroyers. With such firepower, not only was London hoping to get the convoy through intact, but also to take out some of the Italian war machines along the way. Problem was, the Italians responded with overwhelming numbers. When GM2 passed through the Straits of Gibraltar on the night of September 24th, the convoy split into two. This was a part of the plan to appear less numerous than they actually were, to draw the Italians out. And it did work. The merchants and escorts, minus the three battleships, hugged the coast of North Africa, while the heavy hitters sailed parallel to the north. So when Admiral Angelo Iaccino was told of the smaller force near the North African coast, he set out with two Littorio-class battleships, Littorio and Vittorio Veneto, along with four heavy cruisers, 14 destroyers, and 16 submarines and land-based aircraft would be involved as well. The overall attack plan was to have the Italian air power break up the convoy, which would leave the individual ships to their own devices. Italian patrol planes spotted Force H, the battleships, to the north the next day, September 25th, and Iaccino assumed that they were on their way to bombard the Italian coastline. The next day, the 26th, another Italian seaplane found Force H at 9.32 a.m., but only reported one aircraft carrier and one battleship. Either way, Iaccino set sail from Naples, but was told, only engage if you have overwhelming numbers. Now that they had been spotted, Convoy GM-2 morphed into Operation Halbert, the fighting part of getting the supplies to Malta. With the deception detected, Force H, the three battleships, rejoined the convoy at 7.10 a.m. on September 27th, as they were about to sail into the storm that was the massive Italian response. The escorts got into position. The now 16 destroyers formed themselves into a bent line just ahead of the two columns of merchantmen. The flagship Rodney moved in behind the port wing, assisted by the Prince of Wales. HMS Nelson was behind the starboard wing and helped by Ark Royal and two anti-aircraft cruisers. This left the cruiser Sheffield to station itself behind the merchant ships with two destroyers assuming plane guard positions behind the Ark Royal should any downed pilots need rescuing. An hour after this formation was realized, specifically at 8.10 a.m. on September 27th, Italian reconnaissance planes found the Ark Royal and reported its speed of 16 knots, which meant somewhere nearby, merchant ships were within the convoy, and thus a very tempting target. At 10.40 a.m., Admiral Iroccino had the cruisers meet up with his two battleships. An hour later, this fleet was joined by the 8th Cruiser Division. But Iaccino knew that he was already behind the 8-ball, for on the night before, September 26th, Wellington bombers from Malta had raided the enemy airbase at Cagliari on Sardinia and had destroyed a number of enemy planes. And with that, the massive launch of air power against the convoy was reduced. Planes from Sicily, that is, further away from the convoy, would have to participate. But this increased distance reduced their flying time when it mattered most, over the convoy. Either way, the Italian Air Force was asked to have planes over the Italian fleet for protection at 2 p.m. As the about-to-be-attacking Italians thought there was only one battleship, the attack was approved, and 28 torpedo planes were sent aloft with 20 fighters to protect them. The torpedo bombers went into the attack of the convoy at 1 p.m., 
To their surprise, they were met by Fulmar fighters and intense AA fire. Still, three bombers got through and launched their torpedoes at the Nelson. The battleship started to turn to hopefully comb the approaching torpedoes, but was still hit by one of them on her port side of the forecastle. With water coming on board, the Nelson had to slow down to 15 knots, but she kept her position. The Italian torpedo plane that had struck true paid for its success with its crew's lives as she was hit by AA fire and bullets from a full mar coming up from behind. But as the British were about to find out, this many bullets flying around in such proximity could be dangerous to both sides. In all, this torpedo plane and six more, along with a single fighter, never made it home. Also, three British planes were lost, two by friendly fire from the Rodney and the Prince of Wales, with the third being taken out by Italian fighters around 1.30 p.m. Aircraft from Malta got involved and shadowed the Italian fleet, still heading west, but were amazed when the ships turned around. Only later would the British find out that the Italians were following orders, now that they knew there was at least two fully functioning battleships, a wounded third, a carrier, and at least six cruisers. The Italian about-face came at 2.30 p.m., when the attack force was only 40 miles away from the convoy. Many wrecked Allied nerves began to calm down when the enemy withdrawal was reported. But the opportunity to inflict loss on the Italians was not over. Not yet. The Ark Royal sent up planes to track the enemy fleet from 3.15 to 5.50 p.m. At 3.30 p.m., Italian fighters, CR-42s, showed up to protect their naval comrades. But as communications between the branches was still haphazard, the squadron leader of this flight was shot down by friendly AA fire from the fleet below. Sensing a chance to score some real damage on the Italians, the Prince of Wales, Rodney, Sheffield, Edinburgh, and six destroyers were sent on ahead to engage the retreating fleet. But at 5 p.m. they were recalled. The Italian ships were left unmolested, but neither would they be threatening the convoy the most important thing at the moment. At 6.30 p.m., Force H turned about and headed back to Gibraltar. That night, the convoy, still sailing for Malta, hoping the worst was behind them, was set upon by a small number of torpedo bombers, and one freighter, the Imperial Star, was hit by a torpedo. But it was able to maintain its position, with the help of a tow, provided by the destroyer HMS Oribe. However, this did not last long, and the personnel and the other 300 people on board were taken off. Because the chances of losing a ship, or several, during a convoy were quite real, each ship, instead of carrying a lot of one item, had a mix of items on board. Thus, as the Imperial Star had to be scuttled, she took down with her... 12,000 tons of supplies, specifically a few hundred crates of bombs, 500 tons of kerosene, 500 tons of refrigerated meat, grain, flour, and small arms ammunition. However it happened, those crates of bombs, nor the 500 tons of kerosene, went off during the sinking, making everyone's life that much easier. Then the convoy thought they were going to have to deal with the dreaded motor torpedo boats, but search as they might, the small deadly vessels could not make contact with the convoy. To keep the convoy safe as it headed for Malta, the light cruiser Hermione was sent to bombard the airfield on Pantelleria, an island that sits in between Sicily and the jutting part of Tunisia. And finally, the convoy came to an end on September 28th, as the ships pulled into Grand Harbor. There, people were waiting, cheering, waving, knowing that food and other supplies would be available for a while. What they did not know was that this would be the last shipment for some time. 
As for Force H, that night, after leaving the convoy, she was set upon by three Italian submarines. Yet the destroyers and her crews had practiced for this and sent one of them, a dua, to the sea floor. By the time Force H reached Gibraltar, they realized that three Fulmars had been lost to friendly fire. Clearly, observation and communications would have to be improved. However, the Italians had lost 21 aircraft, all told. Sadly, though not as bad as friendly fire, 10 of those planes were lost when they did not have the fuel to return home. When the news of this latest convoy reached London, Admiral Somerville was told he would be knighted for the second time. To this, Admiral Cunningham, his wicked sense of humor rising to the fore, sent him the following message. Fancy twice a night at your age. Postscript. RAF pilot Tom Neal had participated in the Battle of Britain and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross on October 8, 1940 and then a bar on November 26th, 1940. As he remembers it, during the height of the Battle of Britain, he and the other pilots were told the following. When you go up, shoot down as many German planes as you can, but do not get shot down yourself. Clear enough? Yeah, thanks, boss. But it was on November 7th, 1940, when Tom's hurricane collided with another, which ripped off the rear of Tom's plane yet he managed to successfully bail out. Tom would leave Malta at the end of 1942 and would go on to contribute to the Allied victory. After the war, he spent time in the United States in charge of a British consultancy company in Boston. Returning to his home island in 1967, he then became a director of the shoe industry. Tom Neal died on July 11, 2018, three days before his 98th birthday. There are numerous books about his time with the RAF. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I just wanted to take a moment and say hi to some people and thank some new members. Let's see here. Latest members, uh, Christine Kirkham from Salt Lake City, Utah. Christopher Abraham from Ashland, Massachusetts. Uh, Brian Mooney from Talking Rock, Georgia. Shalane's Gems, Shalane's Gems from Greenville, South Carolina. Sorry about that, uh, my home state. So, so I should know the name, but I apologize if I got it wrong. Thomas uh, Stokel, Cass City, Michigan. Steve Tarr from Longmont, Colorado. Joshua Siemens from St. Catharines, Canada. As far as those who have made donations, uh, thank you very much to Michael Ezzo. Andrew Fleming from Shadyside, Maryland. Uh, Jeremy Kolpak. Ronald Wakefield, and Hugh Mateo. Um, I've had a rash of mug <laughs> purchases lately. I'll have to order some more. Uh, Daniel Pacelli from Alamo, California. Justin Steen from Naperville, Naperville Illinois. Uh, Edward Clancy from Halstead, Pennsylvania. And I got a very nice email from a Jacob Hooper. We were talking about um, positive role models for women. So again, thank you to everyone who listens. Thank you everyone who supports the show. And I will see you as soon as I can with the next episode. Take care, everyone.